Many people are fascinated by the late Roman Empire, but not many acknowledge the fact that the Western Roman Empire could have been saved as late as the 460s, just a decade before the deposition of the last Western Roman Emperor. And it was the heroic Emperor Majorian who almost achieved that impossible seeming feat. In three short years from 457 when he became Emperor to 460, the Western Roman Empire went from this to this. Large parts of Gaul and Spain were reconquered for the Western Roman Empire and it seemed as if all the calamities that had taken place over the last half century would be reversed and that Majorian would become a second Aurelian, a restitutor orbis, a restorer of the world, saving the Western Roman Empire from certain doom the same way that Aurelian had saved the Roman Empire 200 years prior. But it was not to be. Majorian's fleet of 300 ships was parked near Carthago Nova at Portus Illicitanus in what is today city of Elche in Spain. In our timeline, we don't know exactly what happened, but in one account, traitors were paid off by the Vandals and they set the ships on fire before they could even set out to conquer the Vandal Kingdom. In another account, the cunning and highly intelligent king of the Vandals, Geyseric, ordered a surprise attack and the fleet was destroyed in the harbor. Whichever account is true, we know that indeed the fleet was destroyed and thus Majorian's grand plan to restore the Western Roman Empire had failed, because he was unable to conquer the Vandal Kingdom and to restore the African provinces to the Western Roman Empire. The very provinces that had been conquered by the Vandals just 20 to 30 years before Majorian's time. On his way back to Italy then, he was betrayed by the bane of the Western Roman Empire, the barbarian Magister Militum Ricimer, who was really effective at destroying every chance the Western Roman Empire ever had of being restored. He ordered the execution of Majorian and thus, with Majorian, so did the Western Roman Empire die. Immediately, all territorial gains of Majorian were undone already in the following year, when the Germanic kings heard what had happened and Aegidius and Marcellinus split away for good from the Western Roman Empire. Seven years after Majorian's death in 468, the very last attempt to save the Western Empire was undertaken with a giant fleet of 1,100 ships sent mostly by the Eastern Roman Empire. But that attempt also ended in disaster. And so was the fate of the Western Roman Empire sealed. I made a detailed trilogy on the life of Majorian as well as a detailed video on the naval disaster at Cape Bon in 468. You can find all these videos on this channel. But what if history had gone differently? What if the Emperor Majorian would have foreseen the treachery of his soldiers? What if he had put much better security measures in place? How might a possible timeline look in which the Emperor Majorian would have been able to restore the Western Roman Empire to its former glory? The biggest character flaw of Majorian was, in my opinion, that he was probably a good-hearted person that was unable to foresee treachery. Maybe he was a bit naive even, for he did not understand the workings of evil very well. And so, he might possibly have been too trusting and not distrusting enough in these dangerous times. At least, that was the case in our timeline. But let's assume now that in a new timeline, he would be more distrusting. Maybe his childhood went differently and he developed as a consequence a more careful attitude, not being too sure of himself, always seeing possible treachery. So let us imagine now that this alternate Majorian was much more careful when he built his 300 ship strong fleet. Maybe he issued false information, confusing the Vandal intelligence as to the location where the fleet was parked. Maybe he split the fleet into multiple smaller fleets, all highly guarded, by shifting guards on rotation, never the same guards guarding the ships with additional security measures in place, and only hand-chosen guards that he trusted. Had he done that, there is a good chance that the Vandals would not have been able to destroy Majorian's fleet. 
It is the summer of 460 AD now. The traitors that would have wanted to burn the Western Roman fleet have been identified and their plan thwarted. They were executed on the spot. Majorian, upon hearing these news, is glad that he put additional security measures and rotating guards of his closest inner circle in place for protecting the fleet. And thus, the time was now ready for the grand finale of his restoration plan. There was only the Vandal Kingdom still missing. Majorian had already sent envoys to Marcellinus of Dalmatia, with whom he had worked together in the last years, a very able general with whose help the Vandals had been repulsed from Sicily, Corsica and Sardinia, and also to the court of the Eastern Roman Emperor. So Majorian set sail to Sicily where he was to meet Marcellinus. Majorian's 300 ships would merge with Marcellinus' 100 ship strong fleet to create an impressive 400 ship strong Western Roman Armada. The meeting between the two is very joyful indeed, as these two great personalities finally meet in their shared vision of a restored Western Roman Empire. Now Majorian had soon false information to Geyseric, as indeed also happened in our timeline, namely that he would land in Mauritania. Geyseric even went as far as to scorch the earth and burn large areas of Mauritania in order to hinder Majorian's reconquest plans. This also happened in our timeline. But in reality, Majorian had never planned to land in Mauritania. That much he had already told Marcellinus and to the Eastern Roman Emperor Leo. And so the United Western Roman fleet sailed to the east of Cape Bon. But of course, Emperor Leo, having received word of this heroic undertaking, also sent an additional hundred ships from the Eastern Roman Empire as reinforcements. And thus this giant 500 ship strong fleet now landed at the southeast of Cape Bon, not far from where Belisarius landed in our timeline only some 70 years later. When Geyseric learns about this landing, it is already too late for him since 35,000 Romans have been unloaded onto the shores of Africa. The Romans of Africa rejoice and Majorian, Marcellinus and the Eastern Roman forces are welcomed as saviors and liberators. For over 20 years had the Romans suffered the yoke of the Aryan Vandals who had suppressed the Chalcedonian Christians of Africa. And thus, there was no opposition whatsoever against Majorian's army from the side of the Romans. And thus Majorian marched on Carthage. He knows that Geyseric would send an army, but he is prepared for battle. With him, he has brought the battle-hardened troops of his campaigns in Gaul and Spain, many powerful foiderati, and even some remnants of the old comitatenses. And if you are like me, a total Rome nerd or Romabu as some people like to say, and I think that you are or else you probably wouldn't be watching this video, then you might be interested in the incredible rings and other Roman accessories which the SPQR shop is building. They make legionary rings, they make rings with different themes, they even make coin replicas, statues, pendants, attributes and terracottas. And the most incredible thing is that they handcraft every single piece. That's right, this is really high quality handcrafted material. There's really no better present for yourself or someone you know who might be a Rome fan. I put the link to their shop in the video description and into the pinned comment. And with this link, you can now even get a 20% rebate for every purchase. I repeat, a 20% price reduction for every purchase from the SPQR shop, which is just an absolutely insane offer. And you can only get it here via the Majorianus link, because let me tell you, the people from SPQR shop also are absolute fans of the heroic Emperor Majorian. So go and check out their incredible sortiment. There will be certainly also something for you. But Geyseric, not having had to fight a large scale land battle in over 20 years, did not have as experienced troops. Geyseric sent all the forces he could muster on such short notice. And since the location of the landing had taken him completely by surprise, he could not muster more than 25,000 troops. And so a huge battle was fought just 30 kilometers to the southeast of Carthage. 
The battle was intense. The Vandals gave everything, but the combined forces of Majorian, Marcellinus and Leo prevailed. The Vandal army was utterly routed and the remainder of the Vandal forces fled. And so, the way to Carthage now free, Majorian proceeds to besiege Carthage. He fully expects a long and draining siege, but to his surprise, the Romans of Carthage rebelled against the Vandals upon hearing the news of Majorian's victory, capturing Geyseric and killing or expelling Geyseric's Vandal soldiers from Carthage. And thus, Majorian enters Carthage and the vastly Roman population is cheering. Never before had they seen a Roman emperor. It is to them as if Trajan himself had returned from the dead. So magnificent is the entry of the emperor into Carthage. Majorian sits down symbolically in Geyseric's throne room, which now henceforth will not be a throne room anymore, but just the interior of the palace of the administrator, the Praetorian prefect of this restored Western Roman province of Africa. And thus, in the fall of 460 AD, the Western Roman Empire shines forth again, the Vandal threat eliminated for good, the grain shipments to Rome restored, and more importantly, the tax revenue from the richest Western Roman province restored. In one fell swoop, the tax revenue of the Western Roman Empire had been doubled. And please consider supporting this channel via Patreon or YouTube membership because I really need your help in order to be able to continue this work on late Roman history. Without your support, I don't know how much longer I can continue this channel because as you can imagine, the YouTube algorithm does not exactly push a niche topic such as late Roman history. Alternatively, you can help this channel by buying my merch directly here on YouTube. I have created a merch store with some cool or funny or weird late Roman merch, which you can buy directly here via YouTube in the video description. Thank you very much. But what to do with Geyseric? He was held by the angry Roman mob in a prison cell. Should Majorian be merciful? Should he exile Geyseric to a land estate somewhere in the far north of Gallia or on the fringes of the Eastern Roman Empire? No, he was too dangerous to be left alive. This bane of the Romans, this scourge of the earth, who in his brutal cunning was for Majorian on par with Attila the Hun regarding the sheer damage he had inflicted onto the Roman Empire. No, he had to go. And thus Majorian ordered the execution of Geyseric in the central forum of Carthage. For all world should see what happens to traitors of the Roman Empire, to those who are enemies of Rome. And there was especially someone in Italy who took notice of these events. One called Rikimer sees the incredible success of Majorian and a certain uneasiness begins to manifest in him. Meanwhile, Majorian decides to stay in Carthage for a few more months, overseeing the transition of Africa back into Roman hands. He issues laws, he appoints government officials and administrators and he appoints the Praetorian prefect of Africa. In the year 461 then, Majorian sees the time come to set sail for Rome. Africa was secure and he would leave some of his best soldiers to secure this new old province against Berber raids and some Vandal remnants that would still not accept the new reality. But they were few and their numbers were dwindling already now. In this moment, he was glad that he had an untrusting nature. One of his spies reported that the Magister Militum Rikimer was plotting against him. Grave news indeed, for Rikimer was still powerful and not to be underestimated. Majorian needed to be very careful. But he would leave Rikimer believing that his plot had not been discovered, making him believe that Majorian still trusted him. And so Majorian sailed to Rome. And in the summer of 461 AD, he entered Rome in a gigantic triumph, such as had not been seen since the last triumph in Rome that had taken place in 417 AD. But this one was even more spectacular. He entered the Via Triumphalis, 
and his route would take him along the exact route of the old emperors. He would even stop at the temple of Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill, a nod towards the old traditions of Rome which Majorian valued above all else. Seeing the still partly damaged state of the city, which still not had fully recovered from the sack of the Vandals in 455, he ordered immediate restoration works to commence. But he knew of course that offending the Christian church was not wise, even for him, and thus he ended his triumphal entry into Rome at the St. Peter's Basilica, paying respect to St. Peter himself. Both pagans and Christians welcomed the respect that Majorian had paid to their respective beliefs and there was no animosity this time, but a feeling of unitedness in the face of this Roman resurgence. Majorian was now sitting in the old palace on the Palatine Hill, where Augustus and Trajan had reigned hundreds of years before him. He is talking with his closest advisors on his next steps. But what to do with Rikimer? In long sessions Majorian debates his advisors how to proceed, but he knows that there is only one way forward. He would need to show strength, the same way as he had done with Geyseric. For was Rikimer not also an enemy of Rome? A traitor to Rome, who pretended to be its defender while secretly plotting with his Visigothic friends against the very empire he had sworn to protect? No, there was only one way forward, and Majorian knew this. Of course he had taken the majority of his army from Africa with him to Rome. The troops were absolutely loyal to their emperor. They had received large sums of pay from the Vandal conquest and had seen many great victories under their emperor. And so Majorian assembled his troops at Rome, giving an epic speech. Ricima must be defeated as he is the last remaining enemy of Rome inside the Roman Empire. The troops are cheering. And thus in late 461, Majorian marches on Ravenna. Rikimer, upon hearing this, assembles all his troops and fortifies himself inside Ravenna, this fortress of a city in which he deems himself invincible. But Majorian has the larger army. And so the siege of Ravenna starts in late 461, and for months the city is besieged. And with every passing month, the discontent in Ravenna grows. And so does the discontent of the population with Rikimer. Who was this half Visigothic, half Suevi barbarian anyway? The Romans of Ravenna had heard the epic stories of Majorian. Here was somebody of the caliber of Aurelian or Trajan. It would be unwise to oppose him. And thus, the people faced with the possibility of the outbreak of hunger and diseases decided to act. They sent secret envoys outside the city and Majorian acted immediately, assuring the conspirators full support and smuggling some of his own soldiers into the city via old forgotten passageways. And thus the population arose. The gates of the city were opened and Majorian's troops quickly entered the city. The forces of Rikima were taken by complete surprise and were either killed or surrendered. And Rikima tried to flee the city in disguise but was found by the angry mob and brought to justice then and there. And so died the bane of the Western Roman Empire, Rikima, the half Suevi, half Visigothic traitor to the Romans. Who knows what damage he would have done to Rome had he been allowed to continue living, Majorian was thinking when he heard the news about Rikimer's demise. He had prevented great damage that day. It is a pity, Majorian thought, that Rikimer had chosen this path. He could have been his greatest general, but he had chosen death. And thus the Roman civil war was over. Majorian was now undisputed ruler of the Western Roman Empire. Marcellinus of Dalmatia, Aegidius of Gallia and Nepotianus of Hispania were made Magister Militum, for never again should only one Magister Militum hold the entire power of the Western Roman army in his hands, Majorian calculated wisely. And thus Majorian returned to Rome in 462 AD, another triumphal entry into the Eternal City rivaling the previous one 
from only one year before. Now it was time for Mujorian to marry. He chose Ariadne, the daughter of the Eastern Roman Emperor Leo. The ties between the two emperors had already been strong since after the Vandal conquest, but now, with this marriage, the ties between the Eastern and Western Roman empires would be again as strong as they had been hundred years earlier. And so the years went by. Stability had returned to the Western Roman Empire. The Foiderati did not dare to attack this once again powerful empire. Their domains were left unchanged, but their kings were forced to abdicate in 470. Majorian had made sure that there should be within the borders of the Western Roman Empire no other authority that could challenge him. With the additional tax revenue from Africa, new Comitatensis legions were recruited that made sure that the Foiderati did not elect kings anymore. And so, slowly, very slowly, they started to assimilate to Roman culture, a culture that was again resurging. The arts saw a huge comeback. Many statues were created again as in the old days. Statues of Majorian, of Ariadne, of Leo, of Marcellinus, of Nepotianus and of Aegidius could be seen across the Western Roman Empire. By 485 AD, an old Majorian was playing with his grandchildren in his residence in the old palace of the Caesars on the Palatine Hill. He had issued many new reforms and laws in the last decades since he had become emperor. The damages of Rome had been repaired and the Eternal City was splendid again. Many of the old monuments had been restored. Paganism was allowed to continue existing. Some temples were even reopened, as Majorian had always been a very tolerant emperor. Meanwhile, his sons were fighting to secure the borders of the empire. And while the Visigoths and Burgundians had accepted Roman rule, slowly assimilating into Roman culture, the Franks and Alemanni were not so forthcoming. But his sons, Marcus and Marcellus, who had become able generals, decisively defeated them, forcing them to become foederati to the empire once again and forcing them to abdicate their kings. Thus, in 490, the Western Roman Empire had again been restored almost to the extent as it had been in 405. But Britannia was still lost to the empire. Even Majorian could not restore everything to its former glory. But who knows, maybe Majorian's sons could one day. On a nice spring day in 495, Majorian looks over the Eternal City. Rome was growing again. 500,000 people were living again in the ancient capital of the Roman Empire, as many as before the Vandal sack of 455. And word was spreading that life was good again in Rome, and so many more people were coming. Majorian was content. He had managed to restore the Western Roman Empire to its former glory, and to restore the old venerable city of Rome to what it once was. A name that you would only utter with the greatest respect and reverence. He had achieved his life's work and so he could die content and with a smile on his face. And thus it came to pass in the year 499 that Majorian died at the age of 74. A very respectable age in those times. A big ceremony was held for him and a tomb was built for him in the heart of Rome not far from the tomb of the Emperor Augustus himself, the founder of the Roman Empire and the restorer of the Roman Empire lying near to each other as it should be. His older son Marcellus was made emperor in 499 in a pompous ceremony and he took the regnal name of Majorian II. Would he be as wise and just as Majorian was? Would he continue reigning with the same vision as Majorian? We can certainly hope, but the chances are good. For in the year 500 AD, the Western Roman Empire is again as strong as it had been a hundred years earlier, in the times of Magnus Maximus, of Aegeus, or of Stilico. The city of Rome shone once again like a jewel of the earth, 
even outshining again the new Rome in the East. The Middle Ages, as we know them, were not happening in this timeline. And who knows how long this Western Roman Empire would continue standing and what other things would have happened. But these are fascinating stories for another time, dear friends of the late Roman Empire. And please like and subscribe so that you won't miss any future videos on the fascinating era of the late Roman Empire. And please consider supporting my work on Patreon or via a YouTube membership, because the long-term sustainability of this channel really depends on your support. This channel would not work without our amazing Patreon and YouTube members, and I really want to thank everyone who is supporting this channel in any way, shape or form. Gratias tibiawa, Miki. And if you want to see the trilogy of Majorian and what happened in our timeline, you can start with this first video of the trilogy in the upper right corner. But if you want to learn more about the Battle of Cape Bon in 468 AD and why this try to restore the Western Empire had failed, you can watch the other video in the lower right corner. I say thanks again to all friends of Roman history. Gratias Tibiago and Bene Valete.